Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all parties are in listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. If you wish to ask a question at this time, please press star 1 on your phone and unmute your phone and record your name so you can be announced for your question. Today's call is also being recorded. If anyone disagrees, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Mr. David Flades. Thank you, and you may begin. Thank you. Welcome to the Fiscal Year 2020 Bank Enterprise Award Program application webinar. As a reminder, participants will be muted until we open the phone lines for questions at the end of the presentation. We are very pleased to open the Fiscal Year 2020 funding round and announce the availability of up to $25 million in appropriated uh, funds for Fiscal Year 2020 BEA Program Awards. By participating in this webinar, we hope to provide you with some information that will be useful when completing your fiscal year 2020 BEA program application. As you can see from the webinar agenda, we will initially provide you with a list of BEA program staff and contact information. Next, we will provide you with an overview of the BEA program. After, afterwards, we will provide you with information on the fiscal year 2020 BEA program application. And lastly, we set aside a few minutes at the end for questions. Please note that the webinar is intended to complement and not supersede a review of key BEA program materials, such as the program regulations, the fiscal year 2020 notice of funding availability, or NOFA, the 2020 program application instructions, and the supplemental guidance and frequently asked questions document. These materials can be found on the CDFI Funds website at www.cdfifund.gov slash BEA. If after participating in this webinar and reviewing these materials, you still have questions, please feel free to contact the CDFI fund. Contact information will be provided in the next few slides. This slide provides the names of the BEA program staff. The BEA program manager is Christopher Allison. Mia Soul is the associate program manager I'm a Senior Policy and Program Officer, and Joan Reed Patrick is a Policy and Program Officer. This slide provides the contact information for the CDFI Fund's main help desk, the BEA program, the CDFI Fund's Certification, Compliance, Monitoring, and Evaluation Department, the CDFI Fund's IT Department, and also to Grants.gov and SAM.gov. The reason that we provide a comprehensive list is to minimize the lost time associated with finding the right resource. Please read the description so that you can direct your questions to the appropriate department. You will notice that the preferred contact method for the CDFI fund is a name of service request. Many of you may be familiar with the CDFI funds award management information system or AMIS for short. This is the CDFI funds administrative applicant and awardee electronic interface. The service request option in AMIS is the preferred way to contact the CDFI fund when you have a question. This system creates a record, tracks, and properly routes questions to the appropriate department. Please note that additional instructions on how to submit a service request have been provided on page 13 of the application instructions and also in the NOFA as, table, as a table one footnote. We will talk more about the AMIS system in the application overview section. Applicants that have questions or technical issues with SAM.gov or Grants.gov will need to address those questions to SAM.gov or Grants.gov since the CDFI fund does not have any control over those systems. I will now turn the presentation over to my colleague, Joan Reed Patrick, and she will provide an overview of the BEA program. Joan? Thanks, David. Um, Hello everyone, as David mentioned earlier, my name is Joan Reed Patrick and I'll be providing an overview of the BEA program. The BEA program is a performance-based grant program that predates the CDFI fund. The program was first created through the Bank Enterprise Act of 1991 and subsequently through the Community Development Banking and Financial Institutions Act of 1994. The first notice of Funds Availability, also known as the NOVA, was published the following year in 1995. The BEA program provides awards to FDIC-insured depository institutions 
that demonstrate increased investment in certified community development financial institutions, also known as CDFIs, and in their own lending, investing, or service-related activities in distressed communities. The BEA program awards are retrospective and are based on demonstrated increases in the BEA qualified activities from one annual reporting period, known as the baseline period, to the next annual reporting period, referred to as the assessment period. Uh, since the first award round in 1996, the CDFI Fund has granted over, over $521 million in BEA program awards. Over the past three years, more than 90% of awardees have been small banks or intermediate small banks. Uh, the impact of the awards during this time period reflects an increase in investment in certified CDFIs by $102.9 million dollars an increase in loans and investments in distressed communities by nearly $1.4 billion, and an increase in financial services in distressed communities by $50.2 million. Uh, this short scene on this slide gives you an overview of the type of award recipients from the last, um, from the last round, which is fiscal year 2019. The data reflects the number of award recipients their CDFI status, their asset size, and even and the funds awarded during the fiscal year 2019 round. Of the total amount awarded, 99% went to CDFIs, 15% went to minority depository institutions, and some of which may also be CDFIs, and 93% went to small and intermediate small banks. Uh, the program awarded $25 million yet um, received over $150 million in requests. Uh, BEA qualified activities are broken down into three categories, namely CDFI-related activities, distressed community financing activities, and service activities. The CDFI-related activities category consists of two subcategories. One is CDFI equity, equity-like loans, and two is CDFI support activities. Uh, CDFI equity-like equity loans include equ equity investments, equity-like loans and grants, and the CDFI support activities include deposit shares, loans, and technical assistance. The distressed community financing activities consist of um, direct lending or investments to residents or businesses in a BEA distressed community. Uh, distressed community financing activities um, is broken down into two subcategories. One is consumer loans, and the other is commercial loans and investments. Uh, consumer loans include affordable housing, education, home improvement, and small dollar consumer loans while commercial loans and investments include affordable housing development, commercial real estate, and small business loans. Um, please note um, that the application instructions incorrectly indicate that a home improvement loan must be secured. So as noted in the DEA regulations and supplemental guidance, a home insurance, I'm sorry, a home improvement loan can either be secured or unsecured. So please refer to the regs or to the supplemental guidance for definitions of BEA qualified activities. Uh, both documents are located on the BEA page of the CDFI Fund website. The final category relates to service activities and consists of deposits, financial services, community services, targeted financial services, and targeted retail savings and investment products. As mentioned earlier, Please note that all these BEA qualified activities, um, the definitions can be taught in the glossary of the fiscal year 2020 supplemental guidance and also in, in the interim rule. Um, in order for an investment to be considered a qualified activity, it must occur in a BEA distressed community. The census tract must meet both the geographic and economic requirements to be considered a BEA distressed community. Um, later in the presentation, we'll discuss how to determine whether or not a census tract meets the criteria for BEA distressed communities. 
Uh, the economic requirement stipulates that at least 30% of the population has income below the national poverty level, and the unemployment rate must be at least 1.5 times the national average. The geographic requirement um, consists of population criteria with a distinction depending upon the proximity to a metropolitan service area. So please note that all Indian reservations meet the geographic requirement. It is also important to note that census tracts may meet these requirements either individually or collectively when aggregated with contiguous census tracts. Our BEF program awards are formulated and are prioritized based on three key factors. The first factor considered is qualified activity type. CDFI related activities are awarded first followed by distress community financing activities, and then service activities. The second factor is the applicant CDFI status. Certified CDFIs are prioritized over non-CDFIs in each qualified activity category and are calculated using a higher award percentage. And the third is the applicant CRA asset size. Um, in calculating the award amount, priority is given to small banks first, using a priority factor of five, followed by intermediate banks, which receive a priority factor of three, and then large banks with a priority factor of one. Um, this formulate nature of BEA provides the flexibility to prioritize awards to organizations with specific characteristics and activity types. Um, this chart uh, provides a visual display of the priority factors and formulas in making an award decision based on the applicant's increase in qualified activities, their CDFI certification status, and their CRA asset size. Uh, please note for its fiscal year 2020 round, the BEA program revised the CRA asset size, estab I mean, used to establish priority factors for activities within the distressed community, financial activities, and service activities categories. So to be classified as a small institution, the applicant's assets as of 12-31-2019 must be less than $226 million. Um, for intermediate to small institution, the asset size must be at least $226 million, but less than $1.305 billion as of 12-31-2019. And for large institutions, as of 12 31 2019, the asset must be $1.305 billion or greater. So please refer to the fiscal year 2020 notebook for more information. Uh, the BEA program awards must be reinvested in additional BEA qualified activities within a performance period of approximately one year. The CDFI fund requires applicants to indicate their intended use of the BEA program award including their decision and whether to use up to 15% for uh, direct administrative expenses and also includes any commitments made to serve persistent poverty counties if selected. Uh, please note all award recipients will need to report on the actual use of the award three months subsequent to the performance period. Also keep in mind the uses of award reports are due 90 days from the end of the per period of performance as specified in the award agreement. So I'll not turn the call back over to David to talk about the application process. Thank you, Joan. As noted earlier, the awards management information system is the CDFI Fund's enterprise-wide business system and primary tool for the CDFI Fund to interface with applicants and award recipients. An AMIS account is required in order to apply for a BEA program award and complete part two, the BEA program electronic application in AMIS. We do not currently have an account. In order to apply for a fiscal year 2020 BEA program award, you will need to register in AMIS and create one. Please note that the last day to do this is Janu June 1st. A link to guidance on how to get started with AMIS is provided on this slide. If you have an existing AMIS account, please make sure that your organization and BEA program profiles are up to date before you begin working on your BEA program electronic application in AMIS. The second link is to the BEA program electronic application training manual. This is an important resource that we recommend that you familiarize yourself with. 
On this slide, we've provided a link to the recorded demonstration of how to navigate and submit DEA program electronic application in AMIPS. The final link is to instructions for the CDFI funds mapping system, also known as SIMS. This document provides guidance for fiscal year 2020 applicants on using SIMS to determine DEA census tract eligibility. Applicants should be aware that they will not be considered for a fiscal year 2020 DEA program award if they have an application pending for assistance under the fiscal year 2020 round of the CDFI program or if they are on the list of award recipients or were awarded assistance from the CDFI fund under the CDFI program within a 12-month period prior to the federal award date of the fiscal year 2020 BEA program award agreement. The BEA program eligibility data continues to be based on the 2011 to 2015 Census Bureau's American Community Survey. However, for the fiscal year 2020, the data has been updated to reflect the BEA program eligibility of the U.S. territories and possessions. This data can be accessed in two ways. One is via SIMS, the CDFI Funds Information Mapping System. This tool is use useful for those looking to geocode or determine contiguity. And second, via the tabular data, which is in Excel format and is posted on the research and data page of the CDFI Funds website. Some, some notable fiscal year 2020 updates and clarifications include for certificates of deposit, we, uh, we're clarifying here that variable rate certificates of deposit transaction must include a description of the methodology used to determine that the rate will be below market for the term of the deposit. For loans refinanced from unaffiliated institutions, Applicants should rely on their own DERP internal documentation to demonstrate to the CDFI fund that the proceeds of their loan were used to pay off an existing loan with an unaffiliated institution. And for closing documents, the closing document requirement for loans in the CDFI-related and distressed community financing activities categories was updated to note that only one closing document is required. Applicants can provide either a copy of the executed loan agreement or the promissory note. Applicants are, however, encouraged to, pro to provide both if they are available. The Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2020 mandates that no less than 10% of award dollars are invested in persistent poverty counties. The Act also expanded the definition of persistent poverty counties to include U.S. territories and possessions. The CDFI Fund has updated the PPC data to reflect this change, and it's available on the research and data page of the CDFI Funds website. Similar to the prior round, fiscal year 2020 applicants will be required to complete Table 8, projected use of BEA program award, and in doing so, indicate the minimum and maximum percentage of their estimated BEA program award that they are willing to commit to deploying in BEA distressed communities that are also designated as being persistent poverty counties. Applicants enter a minimum and maximum percentage ranging from zero to 100%. Applicants are not required to commit to deploying in PPCs. However, applicants should note that if the PPC commitment is not met, the CDFI fund will prioritize awards to those that made commitments. The NOFA offers additional information on how this will be implemented in the award selection process if this 10% commitment has not been met. Also, the tabular DEA program eligibility data mentioned on the previous slide also indicates whether a census tract meets persistent poverty county. In addition to the updates, there are also a few important items that we would like to mention. The first is related to personally identifiable information, also referred to as PII. PII refers to information that can be used to distinguish or trace an individual's identity, either alone or when combined with other personal or identifying information that is linked or linkable to a specific individual. And if lost, compromised, or disclosed without authorization, PII could result in substantial harm, embarrassment, inconvenience, or unfairness to an individual. I'd like to go through each of the bullet points on this slide to emphasize the importance of this and how it can impact your application. 
First, the CDFI fund does not collect and will not accept PII in AMIS or in the supporting documentation submitted in AMIS. Examples of PII include social security number, which alone is considered PII, name, address, driver's license or state identification number, passport number, date of birth, alien registration number. These are other examples of PII, which become PII when combined with another form of PII. For example, a name by itself is not PII, but when combined with an address, it becomes PII. Please remember that address that confirmed the location of a transaction reported to the CDFI fund should not be redacted. This is how the CDFI fund confirms that the transaction occurred in a qualified census tract. So for a consumer loan example, you would redact the name of the borrower and any other form of PAI that's present in the document, but you would need to leave the address. Also, signatures on loan documents such as the loan agreement, promissory note, et cetera, should not be redacted. If legal documents for a commercial loan include the name, address, social security number, or date of birth of an individual, this information should be redacted. Please remember that all PII must be redacted before the document can be sub submitted as part of a BEA application. If the CDFI fund discovers PII during the review of, the, of a transaction in AMIS, the supporting documentation will be deleted and the application record uh, will also be deleted and the CDFI fund will deem the transaction ineligible. If you have any questions about PII, you can submit a service request and a member of the BEA program staff will address it. Another important reminder is regarding the AMIS process for automatically confirming address and census tract eligibility. For many types of transactions, applicants are required to provide both a census tract number and an address. After a transaction is submitted, AMIS will automatically geocode the address in order to confirm that the address provided by the applicant is located in the census tract provided by the applicant. AMIS will flag transactions when the address and census tract do not match. AMIS performs this determination every 24 hours, every business day during the open application period. Applicants can log back into AMIS 24 hours after submitting a transaction to see whether the census tract and address match and whether the transaction is in, a B, in an eligible BEA distressed community. Applicants have until June 1st to enter, edit, or delete BEA transactions in AMIS this is two days prior to the Part 2 BEA application in AMIS deadline. Transactions that are found to be in census tracts that are not eligible or whose census tract numbers and address do not correlate will be deemed ineligible. The last reminder is that fiscal year 2020 award recipients will be required to comply with the Buy America Act of 1933 with respect to direct administrative expenses. More information on this can be found in the Fiscal Year 2020 BEA Notice of Funding Availability, which is located on the, on the BEA page of the CDFI Funds website. As previously mentioned, for Fiscal Year 2020, up to 25 million in appropriations are available for funding. The baseline period for this funding round is January 1st through December 31st, 2018. The assessment period is the following calendar year, January 1st through December 31st, 2019. The BEA program grant application package consists of two parts submitted in two separate systems. Part one is grants.gov, the SF-424 mandatory, and part two is the BEA program electronic application and AMIS. We'll provide more information on this in the next few slides. On this slide, we've provided some basic eligibility information. All BEA applicants must be FDIC insured as of the first day of the baseline period, January 1st, 2018, and maintain FDIC insured status at the time of the application to be eligible for consideration for an award. Bank holding companies are not eligible and should not apply. Credit unions are also not eligible and should not apply. CDFI and non-CDFI banks may apply. And lastly, it's important to note that banks that received a fiscal year 2019 or 2020 CDFI program financial or technical assistance award 
are not eligible to also receive a fiscal year 2020 DEA program award. CDFI applicants must be certified by the end of the assess assessment period, which is 12-31-2019, and maintain their certification until awards are announced. I'd also like to note that applicants that submitted a CDFI certification application by December 31st, 2019, if that application is ultimately approved by April 14th, 2020, those applicants will be considered certified for the fiscal year 20. Uh, 20 BEA program application. Lastly, CDFI partners that receive a loan, investment, or support from a BEA applicant must have been certif uh, certified as a CDFI at the time the loan or investment was made or when the support was received. For CDFI support activities, the CDFI partner must also demonstrate that it is integrally involved in one or more BEA distressed communities. The definition for integral involvement can be found in the fiscal year 2020 NOFA. CDFI partners demonstrate that they are integrally involved in a BEA distressed community by completing the integral involvement form. The NOFA and the integral involvement form are both available on the BEA page of the CDFI funds website. As mentioned earlier in the presentation, the BEA application is submitted in two parts. Part one, the SF-424 mandatory is submitted through grants.gov. And part two, the BEA program electronic application in AMIS is submitted in AMIS. In order to submit an SF-424 mandatory in grants.gov, an organization must be registered in stamp.gov and have an active account. We strongly encourage you to immediately create and or check your existing SAM.gov account to make sure it's active and that your organization's information is accurate. It may take weeks to either establish or update your SAM.gov account, and if you don't start now, you will run the risk of missing the Part 1 Grants.gov deadline. Please remember that the CDFI fund will not consider any applicant that fails to establish or update its SAM.gov account on time and as a result is not able to submit Part 1 of their application on time. The deadline to submit part one of the application is May 4th, 2020 by 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. A part one grant stock of submission is only considered to be acceptable when the SF-424 mandatory is both submitted and validated by grant stock of before the deadline. It's important to emphasize the term validated here Merely submitting the SF-424 mandatory in Grants.gov does not mean that it has been validated. And if it has not been validated, it will not be considered received on time. The CDFI fund can only retrieve a validated SF-424 mandatory from Grants.gov. If the SF-424 cannot be retrieved from Grants.gov, it will not be available to associate with your EA program electronic application in AMIS, and your application will be incomplete. Also, keep in mind that the CDFI fund does not administer grants.gov or SAM.gov. So if you have any questions about uh, these systems or issues using them, you will need to contact them directly. As a reminder, contact information was provided on slide number five of this presentation. The last thing I'll mention here is that it's very important that the information on the SF-424 mandatory submitted in grants.gov matches the information for the applicant in AMIS. To many of you, this may seem obvious, but we have seen instances where the information does not match, and when it doesn't match, uh, it cannot be associated with the organization's electronic application in AMIS. For example, do not submit Part 1, the SF-424 mandatory, in Grants.gov using the bank holding company's name, EIN, or DUNS number, and then attempt to submit the BEA program electronic application in AMIS using the information for the bank's subsidiary. Remember, bank holding companies cannot apply and the information must match. For part two, the deadline for transactions and supporting documentation is June 1st at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. No additional supporting documentation or transactions can be submitted after this date. After June 1st, applicants will have the ability to review the application answer the environmental review questions, upload the validated SF-424 mandatory via the lookup function, and sign and submit the completed application up and until the June 3rd 
5 p.m. overall deadline. Also, please note that applicants that submitted a CDFI certification application by December 31st, 2019, if that application is pending approval, we encourage while you can begin entering application data in AMIS, we recommend and encourage that you wait to submit the overall application until after April 14th, 2020, so that we can ensure that the CDFI certification status is accurately reflected in the application. Here we have, here we have uh, provided some important dates. Please, once again, pay close, pay close attention to the two dis, uh, separate and distinct deadlines for Grants.gov and AMIS. All times noted are Eastern Standard Time. It's important to make sure that your documents are submitted on or before the respective deadline This Failure to do so will result in the application not being considered for an award. The BEA program office is available to answer application-related questions until June 1st at 5 p.m. Eastern Time which is two days before the part two deadline of June 3rd at 5 p.m. Application-related questions received after that will not be answered. The CDFI Fund's Information Technology Help Desk will be available through the application deadline of June 3rd to answer any technical questions and resolve any systems-related issues. This concludes the fiscal year 2020 BEA program application webinar uh, we thank you for your participation. We would also like to note that the audio version of this presentation will be available on the BEA page of the CD5 Funds website in about a week. And now that we're done, we would like to open up the line for questions. Thank you. If you'd like to ask a question over the phone, please press star 1. Please ensure your phone is unmuted and record your name to ask a question. Again, that is star 1 to ask a question. One moment, please, while we wait for questions to come in. Our first question comes from George. Your line is open. You may go ahead. Hi. I was just wondering, uh, with last year's awards, how many non-CDFIs uh, were uh, received an award? I believe there was a few. We don't. I don't know if we have the slide reflects that. Ninety-eight percent of the banks that applied were. CDFIs. Um, the awards, as Joan mentioned when she was covering how awards are prioritized, the awards are prioritized first and foremost by activity type. So CDFI-related activities are awarded before distressed community financing activities or, and service activities. So the, you know, for non-CDFIs looking to apply for an award, uh, you know, if you want to make sure that you're you know, um, that your application is prioritized based on the activity types you submit. The CDFI-related activities would would be the, you know, um, the best opportunity to, um, you know, make it and be considered for an award. It also depends, um, you know, really on what the overall applicant pool ends up looking like once we receive the application, um, how the awards uh, will will, uh, you know, sort of uh, what the demographics of the, of the awardee pool will ultimately be. I know there was a few last year, but I don't have a number that I can give you right offhand. No, I appreciate it. That's, that's good. Thank you. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1, unmute your phone, and record your name to ask that question. One moment. There are no additional questions at this time.
Okay, well, once again, we appreciate your participation. Joan and I are available to answer questions up and until application related questions up and until two days before the application due date, which is June 1st. So please take advantage. Please remember that service requests are the preferred method of receiving questions. So you can you log into Amos and submit the questions uh, via service request and we'll address them. Um, you know, we'll try to address them quickly so that you all can um, have the information that you need to complete your applications. Um, thanks again, and, um, you know, please let us know if you have any, any questions. We're available. That concludes today's conference. Thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect. Speakers, please stand by.